الحمد لله رب العالمين له الحمد الحسن والثناء الجميل وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له يقول الحق وهو يهدي السبيل وأشهد أن سيدنا ونبينا محمد صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وأصحابه والتابعين لهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين أما بعد We were in the long hadith of Jabir ibn Abdullah رضي الله تعالى عنهما May Allah be pleased with Jabir and his father Abdullah ibn Haram رضي الله تعالى عنه The hadith is, as I said to you, is one of the most powerful hadiths that talks about the Prophet Sallallahu Hajj. We spoke about this hadith, a bit about the story behind it. And now what we want to do is, inshallah ta'ala, is to talk about what the Prophet did for Hajj. We already know how to do Hajj, correct? And we've t- taken that, we've studied that. We've taken a basic overview, and then we went a bit detailed. Now we want to know is, what did the messenger do, alayhi salatu wasalam? What was his hajj, hajj like, inshallah ta'ala? Where did I stop? So, yeah, I spoke about la sharika lak. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi when he said la sharika lak, oh Allah tabarak wa ta'ala, you have no partners. And he means, oh Allah, you don't have partners in the creating. And oh Allah, you don't have partners in the blessings that you have bestowed upon us. All of these blessings of us coming to your house, for us to do these righteous actions. Oh Allah, all, all of it is from you. And it's like the ayah, وَمَا بِكُمْ مِنْ نِعْمَةٍ فَمِنَ اللَّهِ There is no blessing that we are given. And going to the house of Allah is a blessing. that everyone gets that. It's only from you, oh Allah. That's what the messenger is saying, alayhi salatu wasalam. حتى إذا أتينا البيت استلم الركن. Then the Messenger صلى الله عليه وسلم he came to the Kaaba. And when he came to the Kaaba, استلم الركن. He he touched صلى الله عليه وسلم the corner. فرمل ثلاثا ومشى أربعا. The Messenger صلى الله عليه وسلم we spoke about the situations in which a person should touch the black stone. We spoke about that, right? And the four situations where you touch it. Um, or how you touch it. The four, four situations of how you touch it. Can anyone remind me of how the four situations were? Uh, your first one was what, Muhammad? You kiss it and you touch it, hey? The second one is you're unable to do it. You're unable to uh, kiss it, so you touch it only. The, th- the third one was what? You touch it with what? I want it in order. You touch it what? A stick or something in your hand. That's correct. Sah, sah. Ah, yeah. And then the fourth one is? Uh, the fourth one is? With both hands or one hand? With one hand. Jazakumullah khairan. Barakallah fikum. What is the wisdom of touching the black stone? Huh? We're honoring Allah Azza wa Jalla. And we're following who? The Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Do we believe that the black stone can benefit us and harm us? No. The benefiting and the harming is from who? It's from Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. We only touch the two, the two sides of the Kaaba which are facing towards what? Yemen. And the ones that are facing towards Sham, do we touch it? No, we don't touch it. What does the person say when he touches the black stone? You say, Bismillahi, Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar came from who, this? Allahu Akbar is a prophetic, there's a prophetic action. And the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did that. But what about Bismillahi? It came from Abdullahi Ibn Umar. And we do it because Abdullahi Ibn Umar was known for his what? For his following of the Sunnah. Not to mention, Abdullah ibn Umar would do that in the presence of all the other companions and no one would object to it. So they were kind of silent about it. They were in affirmation towards it. The Sahabas don't, don't watch each other in wrong. They don't. If one does a mistake, the other one would correct him. So the fact that they watched Ibn Umar do this and they didn't correct him is an, is an indication that they, are, that they are for it. Good. Um, what is the virtue in touching the black stone? 
What virtue did I mention? If you touch it, what virtue comes with it? Your sins are wiped away from you. Good. Another thing I mentioned? It will come the day of judgment as a witness for you. If you touched it with what? The Prophet has said it will come the day of judgment with two eyes to see, a tongue to talk. And it would witness for Yashhadu ala kulli man ala kulli man istalamahu bi haqqin. And it will testify for everyone who touched it with truthfulness. The person whose heart was real, the one who went there to show, tell his friends that I'm in the Kaaba to take a selfie and to record himself, that's not the discussion. It's not him. He wants to show off in the house of Allah. He's talking about the one who is sincere, who is real. He came to the Kaaba because to fulfill the obligation and to please his Lord. Is it permitted and is it allowed to touch the black stone in other than Hajj and Umrah? I said the overwhelming majority of the scholars are of the opinion that no. It's only when you're in Hajj and Umrah and when you touch the black stone. Okay. حتى إذا أتينا البيت استلم الركن فرمل ثلاثا ومشى أربعا فرمل ثلاثا ومشى أربعا. This is the circumambulation of the Messenger صلى الله عليه وسلم around the around the Kaaba. So if someone was to ask you what was the first thing that the Messenger did when he came to the Kaaba, what do you say? Generally he did tawaf. What's the name of that tawaf? What's the name of that tawaf? What's it called? The tawaf where the messenger came alayhi salatu salam and he did as soon as he came. It's called tawaful qudum. Write this down. It's very important information. It's called tawaful qudum. What does the tawaful qudum mean? It's the, it translates loosely the tawaf of arrival. It's the tawaf of arriving. You do that. So the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he did tawaf around the Kaaba. The hadith says, فَرَمَلَ ثَلَاثًا ما معنى فَرَمَلَ ثَلَاثًا He jogged. He jogged for three. And he walked for how much? I told you the wisdom yesterday, right? Of why he jogged three. The wisdom I told you. Because in Medina, there was this mosquito that used to really cause a lot of problems to the people of Medina. It was known. And so what they said was the Quraysh, the pagans, the people of Mecca, they said that a people from Yathrib, meaning Medina, are going to come. And they're going to come to Mecca, who are weak, who can't do anything. And so the Prophet wanted to show them that there is, that's not the case. But we said because that was the reason why the Messenger did it, is not the, uh, it doesn't mean that it stops there and we don't do it again. We carry on doing that. It becomes something that we do. Insha'Allah, إِلَىٰ أَنْ يَرِثَ اللَّهُ الْأَرْضَ وَمَنْ عَلَيْهَا Until the Day of Judgment, we do that. ثُمَّ أَتَى مَقَامَ إِبْرَاهِيمَ And the Messenger صلى الله عليه وسلم, he, he came to Maqam Ibrahim. Before I go to Maqam Ibrahim, let me mention some issues of Tawaf. So when the Tawaf, where do you start the Tawaf from? The Black Stone. And you finish at the Black Stone. Very good. The Kaaba is going to be on what side? Your left or your right side? It's going to be on your? It's going to be on your, the Kaaba is going to be on your left side. Correct? No? And Alhamdulillah, you don't have to worry in that regard because you're never going to come to the Kaaba when there's no one doing Tawaf. So you'll see the people going. I don't think anyone would go the opposite direction of the people. Sah? So generally, that's not something to worry about. But the early scholars, they used to write this in their books um, to just state it, just to make things clear. So the Kaaba is going to be on your left. And you start from the black stone. What about if a person does tawaf uh, six times? Thinking that he, sorry, he does six tawafs and he is sure that he did six, but he's doubtful whether he did the seven. What does he do? So he sticks to what he knows, which is the six, and he just does the extra one that he's doubtful of. And that's based on the qa'ida, qa'ida al fiqiyya al kubra which is الْيَقِينُ لَا يُزَالُ بِالشَّكَ مَا لَا يَزُولُ بِالشَّكَ You stick to what you're sure of. And that one that you're doubtful of, do it. Do it, so you stick to what you know. 
stick to what you remember. Is there a particular dhikr that the person should do when they do tawaf around the Kaaba? Is there a particular dhikr that you should do? Um, Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah, he said, وَلَيْسَ لَهُ Tawaf does not have dhikr al-makhsusun ali Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa There's no particular dhikr when you're doing tawaf around the Kaaba. There isn't. He never commanded it. Salawatullahi wa sallallahu alayhi wa He never taught the companions something that they should say. He didn't. So the person, he should make general dua, you know, if, and if he wants to read Quran and he wants to pick up a mushaf whilst going around the Kaaba, he can do that. No problem. Naam. Lakin, it's an innovation to say the first time I go around the Kaaba, my dua is going to be this one. And the second time I go around the Kaaba, it's going to be this dua. And the third one is going to be this. Specifying a particular dua and making it like that becomes an innovation. Because the messenger didn't do that, nor did his companions do that. That takhsis, that specification needs evidence. Just say it. Natural. Because remember, we're not allowed to specify something that the Prophet didn't specify. We have to follow him in everything. Are we all together? It's important. And I remember what we said last time. Hajj al is a what? Hajj that's done in accordance to the what? Accordance to, accordance to the Sunnah. So when you go to the house of Allah and you go to the Kaaba, you want to do it in accordance to the sunnah, everything, step by step. Um, tawaf, what did we say? Do you have to have wudu or not? We said, if you believe, the, if you see the hadith of the Prophet and you understand it as tawaf is salah, where the Prophet said tawaf is like salah, except that you could what? Except that you could talk in the tawaf. If that's the opinion you take, then you're going, to, you're going to definitely say what? You're going to say wudu is required and tahara is required. Whether it be hadad al-asghar or akbar. And if that understanding of the hadith is not like that for you, then you'll see it as to be no problem uh, to do tawaf. Lakin, there is a jama'ah min al-salaf, a group of the salaf, who understood the hadith not to mean that you, ha- you can't have wudu. ولذلك ابن أبي شيبة نريتد عن شعبة بن حجاج أبو بسطام العتكي that he said سألت حمادا I asked حماد ومنصورا and I asked منصور وسليمانا and I asked سليمان عن الرجل يطوف بالبيت a man who does tawaf and circumambulation around the كعبة على غير طهارة with no طهارة and then فلم يروا به بأسا they saw no problem with that so it's a difference of opinion um, I'm of the opinion you don't have to have it but I definitely wouldn't go around the Kaaba without having tawaf. I wouldn't. But I don't see that it's obligatory to have it. We mentioned also the tawaf of the Prophet ﷺ. He did what is known as al idbah Idbah is what? Yeah? Uncovering the right side. It's to uncover your arm, your right arm. You show it. Okay? And you place the ending of the ihram on top of your left shoulder. You do that. Um, and how long, do you, how, how, how long do you do this for? In your tawaf al-qudum. The, specifically, I'm talking about the tawaf al-qudum. The tawaf al-qudum, you do it for all of the seven. Okay? The tawaf al-qudum, you do it for every single one of those seven. What's the wisdom behind it? Why is, what's, the, what's the wisdom behind showing your right arm? The wisdom the scholars, they said that the Prophet did it, alayhi salatu wasalam. See, there's two different things that people always get it wrong. And I really, if, I really want you guys to ponder on this. And this is something, wallahi, I benefited from Sheikh al-Albani, rahimahullah ta'ala. I really did. Sheikh al-Albani has 800 and something tapes. It's called Silsila Huda Wan Noor. I listen to each and every one of those. People ask him questions, they have discussions with him, back and forth. The Sheikh goes in with these discussions. 800 and something. Ala kulli hal. One of the things I benefited from his discussion with people was that people would say, Sheikh, what's the, what's the wisdom behind this action? And he would always correct them and say to them, I may not know the wisdom and I may know the wisdom. That doesn't change the ruling. And he used to say, distinguish between the ruling and the wisdom. And that's, so, that's a vital information here. It's gold. Just because you don't know the wisdom of something doesn't change the ruling. Are we all together? So when you're educating the people, Sheikh used to say that you say, first of all, ask for the ruling. That's what benefits you. 
because you don't have to do an action because you understand the wisdom. You do it because of its ruling. Are you, are you with me, brothers? The wisdom, we may sometimes know why something was legislated and we may not know it. For example, pork, when we don't know the wisdom of why we're, we're not allowed to eat it. We don't know. There's no, nothing for it. Are we, are we all together? Are you going to eat it? No. You're going to worship Allah on what He's commanded you. That's, a, that's something. Are we all together? We know alcohol why. We know why we can't drink alcohol. We know the wisdom. But we don't know the wisdom for pork. Are we all together? Many people try to give excuses because it's an animal that does this to itself or it's an animal that's got this much disease in it or it's an animal that's got that. All of that is no evidence for it. Are we all together? So wisdom and ruling are two separate things. You need to distinguish one from the other. Okay? As a slave of Allah, what matters to you is the ruling. The ruling is what matters to you. Is it permissible? Is it not permissible? Once you learn it, as, a, as an extra point, you might say, okay, what's the wisdom? I just want to know. But to push a ruling away because you don't understand the wisdom or the wisdom doesn't make sense to you, that is juhud and inad, stubbornness and hard-headed against Allah wa ta'ala. Does that make sense? Important. So sometimes we're just going to mention some of the actions, what's the wisdom behind it? The scholars, they say the wisdom by why the messenger showing the right arm is because if you cover both arms, it's a bit hard for you to run. It's hard for the person to circumambulate around the Kaaba, especially if they're jogging for the first three. So this helps your arms to run. The scholars mentioned that wisdom. Okay? Whether that's right or wrong, it doesn't change the ruling of what we're going to do. فَرَامَ لَثَلَاثًا The Prophet ﷺ, he jogged for three and he ran for four, uh, walked for four. Who is it not permissible for them to jog? The people who are, are two types. Or two types of people, it's not legislated for them to jog. Number one is the people of Mecca, Ahlul Mecca. The scholars, they say, Abd Ibn Abdul Bar, he said, fi ahli Mecca. The scholars, they, distinct, they dib- dib- disputed one another regarding the people of Mecca. Ida hajju hal alihim ramal am la. The people of Mecca, if they do hajj, do they jog or they do not? Do they do not? فَكَانَ إِبْنُ عُمَرٍ عَبْدُ اللَّهِ إِبْنُ عُمَرٍ لَا يَرَى عَلَيْهِمْ رَمْلًا He never saw jogging for the people of Mecca. إِذَا طَافُوا بِالْبَيْتِ if, were, if they circumambulated around the Kaaba. Ibn Qudama, he said, وَلَيْسَ عَلَىٰ أَهْلِ مَكَةِ رَمْلٌ The people of Mecca is not for them to jog. وَهَذَا قَوْلُ ابْنَ عَبَّاسِ وَابْنُ عُمَرٍ That's the statement of Ibn Abbas and Ibn Umar. رَحْمَةُ اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِمَا وَكَانَ ابْنُ عُمَرٍ إِذَا أَحْرَمِ مَكَةَ لَمْ يَرْمُلْ And Abdullah ibn Umar was one that if he went, if he was doing ihram from Mecca, he wouldn't do that. If he was in Mecca and he was staying in Mecca, he wouldn't. Abdullah ibn Umar. But if he came from outside, he would. Why? Because he, he, the reason is because لَيْسَ لَهُمْ طَوَافُ الْقُدُومِ The people of Mecca, they don't have طواف الْقُدُومِ Naam. Because they are the residents of Mecca. They are the residents of Masjid al-Haram. The second type of people that Ramli is not for is النِسَاء Women. فَلَيْشُرْ عَلَهُمُ الرَّمْلُ Women do not jog. And this is a consensus. There's no difference of opinion. Imam al Nawi he said اتفق العلماء على أن الرمل لا يشرع للنساء Ibn Nawawi said, there's a consensus amongst the scholars that the women do not jog. It's not legislated for them. كَمَا لَا يُشْرَعُ لَهُمْ As it's not legislated for them, شِدَّةُ السَّعِي بَيْنَ الصَّفَى وَالْمَرْوَةِ The jogging that is done in Safa wal Maru, which is going to come to us inshallah ta'ala. And if the man leaves off the jogging, وَلَوْ تَرَكَ الرَّجُلُ الرَّمْلَةِ If the man leaves off jogging, he doesn't do it. The places that he, the Prophet did it, in the three First, tawafs, or in Safa wal Maru, that particular gr- the two green lights, which we're going to talk about soon. If he doesn't do no ramli there, he doesn't jog in any of those places. For sunnah. Now, we said he only left a sunnah. وليس, وليس there is nothing upon him. There's nothing upon him. He just left a sunnah. Now. Second point I was going to bring now. The one who's doing tawaf around the Kaaba, what does he do if he's unable to do it because of the crowd? Then he walks. Because again, it's a sunnah. 
even if he's circumambulating around the, the th first three, if it's going to cause harm to the people, for instance, or you may make a problem because of your jogging or whatever, then because it's a sunnah, you'd leave it off not to harm the people. ثُمَّ أَتَى مَقَامَ إِبْرَاهِيمَ فَصَلَّى Then the messenger came to Maqam Ibrahim. The messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he came to Maqam Ibrahim. فَصَلَّى He prayed. ثُمَّ رَجَعَ إِلَى الرُّكْنِ فَاسْتَلَمَهُ The messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he came to Maqam Ibrahim. Maqam Ibrahim, it's a hajar, a stone in which Nabilah Ibrahim stood on when he was building the Kaaba. Remember that that land was a bit high? He stood there and they say that his legs are there today. That's what they say. And that's where he stood on when he was building the Kaaba, Nabilah Ibrahim. And Allah wa Ta'ala, he said in the Quran, وَاتَّخِذُوا مِن مَقَامِ إِبْرَاهِيمَ مُصَلَّى Take from the maqam of Ibrahim a musalla, a place, a place to pray. So the messenger came there, maqam Ibrahim, and what did he do? Fasalla. He prayed, sallallahu wa sallam, What does the person read in the first raka'ah when he comes to maqam Ibrahim? The first one you read, qul ya ayyuhal kafirun. And in the second you read, qul huwallahu, qul huwallahu ahad, as in sahih muslim. Question is, is it necessary? Do you have to, as some people think, that I have to be right in front of the Maqam Ibrahim and then the Kaaba's after that. If I don't, then I haven't done what was right. No, that's not the case. You can do it uh, in any place in the Haram. Any place. It doesn't have to necessarily be right in front of the Maqam Ibrahim. It's good if you can do it there. But sometimes some people are doing it whilst the people are doing tawaf around the Kaaba. And they get kicked around and they get pushed and they cause a havoc around the tawaf. You see... Um, it's good to avoid it. Sometimes doing it at that area is also not healthy because there are sisters who come and they do it as well right next to you. Those of you who've gone will see that. Or a woman will be right in front of you, trying to pray right in front of you. So sometimes it's actually better to just leave and go somewhere else and pray it. If that's taking place. If not, then it's best to uh, pray right in front of the maqam. Um, question here now. The person has done the tawaf. He has... Uh, Finished the tawaf, he prayed behind Maqam Ibrahim. What did the Prophet وسلم, do here? What did the Prophet وسلم, do? The Prophet went back to where? The Rukun. He went back to the Rukun to touch it. Write this down. When are the times where the person touches the black stone? When is it? Three places. Three situations the person should touch the black stone. It's sunnah to touch it. The Sunnah has shown us. The first one is fi bidayat tawaf at the beginning of the tawaf. The second place is the fi bidayat tawaf. Remember, we mentioned it. Hatta ida atayna al bayt astalam al rukna. Before he did the tawaf, he touched it, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and then he started his tawaf. That's the first. The second one is athna al tawaf ida marra bihi. Whilst you're doing the tawaf, if you go by it, you touch it. Whilst you're doing the tawaf. And the third one is عقيب الصلاة ركعتين خلف المقامين. And this is the one that we're talking about here. Once you finish the two rak'ah in front of uh, Maqam Ibrahim. Maqam Ibrahim is in front of you. When you pray the rak'atain of Maqam Ibrahim, it's also a legislated place to... Um, it is... It's a sunnah to touch it then as well. All of those situations I'm mentioning, if there's going to be a greater harm from it, then it's not good. Leave it. If you're going to harm a woman or you're going to harm a child, or you're going to, don't do it. Um, in Musnad al-Imam Ahmed, it's not mentioned in Hadith Jabir, like in Musnad al-Imam Ahmed, the Messenger Sallallahu when he touched the stone, black stone, he went and he drank zamzam water. And he poured some of it on his head. This is in Musnad al-Imam Ahmed. Question now I want to ask. Where did the Prophet go right? Uh, no, this place, we touch it. We're talking about touching it. The Prophet وسلم, drank the zamzam water and then he poured some of it on his head. He poured it on his... He poured it on his head. Alayhi salatu, alayhi salatu Question here now. Where does he have to go after this? 
Sa'i Safa wal Marwa. Question here. Before we move on to this, what is the ruling of Al Muwalatu Bain al Tawaf wa Raka'atini? The Tawaf that you do and the two Raka'at that you pray behind Maqam Ibrahim, does it have to be straight after each other or can there be a, a pause, a, a time where you relax? The scholars have two opinions. Two opinions. And Al Muwalat al Sunnah. That after you finish the tawaf, going to Maqam Ibrahim and praying two rak'ah is a sunnah. So if a person, uh, a long time goes in between it, they say it's permissible, no problem. If he goes to the haram and he lies down for a bit and then he comes up and he, no problem. That's the first opinion. And that's the qawlu al-hanafiyyah wa shafi'iyyah wa al-hanabila. And they, they use the statement of Abd Umar ibn al-Khattab, what he did. Number two is, the second view is, that it's uh, something that must be done. It has to be done. Those are the two opinions. It brings me to the next point, which is um, the uh, Safa and the Tawaf. You have to do it straight after each other. There's also two opinions. One opinion is the first one, which is that is Sunnah. After you do the tawaf and you pray the two rak'atain and then you drink the zamzam water, straight away do you have to go to the sa'i, safa wal maru? The first view is that it's a sunnah, you don't have to. Again, it's madhab inda shafi'iyya and qawlul hanabila. The second opinion is anna al-mualat bayn al-safa, tawaf, bayn al-tawafi wal sa'i. Between the tawaf and the sa'i is a shartun, it's a condition. So if a person puts a long time in between it, uh, they are against it. And this is the call of the Malikiya and a, a view in the Shafi'iyah. Now the person, after having prayed the two rak'ah behind the Maqam of Ibrahim, Nabi Allah Muhammad, as he did, as after the Prophet Sallallahu prayed the two rak'ah um, behind the Maqam of Ibrahim and he drank the Zamzam water, the Messenger, what did he do? ثُمَّ خَرَجَ مِنَ الْبَابِ إِلَى الصفا. The Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he went to Safa. When the Prophet came close to Safa Qara'a, he recited, Inna Safa wal Marwata min Sha'a'ilillah. The Messenger recited that the, he recited, Inna Safa wal Marwata min Sha'a'ilillah. He recited that. So it's recommended for the person to recite that when they get close to Safa. That's when they get close to Safa, not when they climb Safa. Some people they do it when they climb it, it's when you get close. It's also not a sunnah to finish the whole entire ayah. It's not. Only thing you need to say is, Inna safa wal marwata min sha'airillah. That's all. That's all the Prophet read. فَمَنْ حَجَّ الْبَيْتَ أَوْ يَعْتَمَرَ فَلَا جُنَحًا No, no, no. The Prophet didn't recite that part. Ah. So we just read that part. Inna safa wal marwata min sha'airillah. That's all he read. What's the re- wisdom of reading that? What's the wisdom? Number one is to follow the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The second wisdom is to follow Allah's command. Allah. That's the wisdom. And number three is the person to make himself feel that he's coming to one of the sha'air of Al-Islam. One of the symbols of Al-Islam. Safa wal marwa is from the symbols of Islam. So he's mentioning and he's reminding himself that. Another point is, does a person say this? In every single shot, does he say that every single time? Every, t- every single time that he comes to Safa, does he say that? And every time he comes to Marwa, does he say that? It's not said. It's that he only says it إِذَا أَقْبَلَ عَلَى الصَّفَى مِنْ بَعْدِ الطواف. He says it for Safa only after he just came from the Tawaf. You don't say it after that. You do not say it to Marwa. And you do not say it to Safa the second time you come to it again. You only say it once. Where does the person start from? The Prophet said, Abda'u bima bada Allahu bihi. I start from where Allah started from. There's a, there's a fa'idan that is taken from here. Are we all together? There's a benefit that is taken from here, which is the ayah says, Inna Safa. Safa. Wal marwata and marwa. Min sha'a'ilillah is from the symbols of Islam. 
The, ben the benefit that's taken from here is that the wow in the Arabic language does not show tartib and taqib. It doesn't show sequence and order. Inna safa safa. Wal marwata and marwa. It doesn't show which one comes first. It's like saying dakhala zaydun wa amrun. Zayd and Amr came in. Because I mentioned Zayd first, that doesn't mean Zayd came in first into the room or into the masjid. And then Amr came next. It just shows that they both came in. But it doesn't show which one came in first. The wow doesn't benefit that. The wow in the Arabic language doesn't show which one came in first. Like in the word Thumma, Thumma, what does it show? Generally, Thumma shows Tartib. If I say Dakala Zaydun, Thumma Amrun, and then Amr, it means Zayd came first and Amr came after. Because look at the ayah, Inna Safa, verily Safa. Wal Marwa and Marwa. It doesn't show which one comes first. That's why the Sahabas, they asked the messenger, they said, Ya Rasulullah, which one should we start from? If the wow showed order, they wouldn't have asked that question. It would have been clear to them. They're, they're Arabs. They understand the language. They wouldn't have said to the Prophet, should we start from Safa or Marwa? And then the messenger told them, start from which one Allah started from. That's why we start from Safa, because the Prophet now told us which one we should start from. Are we all together? So the person should start from Safa. Uh, the Prophet said here, Abda'u, I start from bima bada Allah bihi, that which Allah started with. You start from that. What does a person do when he is on Safa? What are the things that he should do? It is recommended for him to face the Qibla and he raises his hand. And the way he raises his hand is the way he normally raises his hand when he's making dua. It's recommended that he singles Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala and he glorifies Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala by saying La ilaha illallah wahdahu la sharika lah lahu al-mulku wa lahu al-hamdu wa huwa ala kulli shay'in qadir La ilaha illallah wahda anjaza wa'da wa nasara abda wa hazama al-ahzab wahda And we're going to see that that's what the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said in the hadith of Jabir We're going to see that inshallah ta'ala We're going to see what it means Do you be, do, Does a person have to be upon tahara when they are doing the sa'i, should you pee upon tahara? No. You, should, you don't have to be on tahara. You can do it without tahara. The sa'i. How do you start the, uh, how do you do the sa'i? The way that you do the sa'i is that you start from safa and you will end up finishing where? Marwa. You finish in marwa, right? That's the tawaf. It's seven. One. Two, three, four, five, six, and then seven. Okay, some people, they don't understand that. So they think one, and then two is, they consider that to be one. Meaning they suffer, they think go, you have to come back from suffer and go back to suffer, there's one. So you end up doing how much? Fourteen. No, you just do seven. So you start from suffer, one, and then two, and then three, and then four, and then five, and then six, and then seven, you finish at Marwa. That's how you do it. Here the hadith says, Faraqa Safa, the Prophet climbed the mountain of Safa, Hatta Ra al Bayta, until he looked at the house, the Kaaba. So when you climb Safa, you look at the Kaaba. You face towards the Kaaba, as I said. The Prophet did that. Fastaqbal al Qibla, the Prophet faced the Qibla. Fawahad Allah. Can you see what he says there? Yeah, what did he say? So Tawheed is, is found in the hadith of the Prophet. Some say, where is this word Tawheed from? Why you, where do you get this from? Fawahad Allah here is. Are we all together? So what we learn from Hajj brothers is Tawheed. Tawheed, the concept of Tawheed. This place is Labbaik Allahumma. When you're starting your... The concept of Hajj is Tawheed. It's sad, Wallahi. It's extremely sad to go to the Kaaba and see people calling on to other than Allah. Wallahi, you hear it. You're shocked. He's calling on to onto a wali. And the whole concept of Kaaba is Allah, glorification of Allah. The Messenger of Allah look what he said, La ilaha illallah. What does La ilaha illallah mean? La ma'buda bi haqqin illallah. There is none worthy of worship except Allah. That's what he's saying. And look what he said, Wahdahu alone. La sharika la. Look how he's emphasizing on it. La ilaha illallah is enough. That there is none worthy of worship except Allah. Wahdahu, him alone. Wahdahu affirms illallah. 
And they look at the Prophet, he even affirmed it more, La Sharika Lah, which emphasizes on La ilaha illallah. La Sharika Lah is an emphasis for La ilaha illallah. La ilaha. That's what the Messenger said. So it's a concept of a Tawheed. It's a concept of a Tawheed. And inshallah ta'ala, if we get a time, we will talk about just by itself, maybe if Allah gives us the time before Hajj, to talk about the, 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 the concept of Tawheed in Hajj. One day we can do that. And how it affects the whole Hajj. And how the Prophet emphasized on it. And what he said, we're going to see in Arafah, أَفْضَلُ مَا قُلْتُ أَنَا وَالنَّبِيُّونَ مِنْ قَبْلِ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ the Messenger said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the best thing, me and those previous prophets that came before me, the best thing that they said in the day of Arafah was what? La ilaha illallah. The best thing that you can say on the day of Arafah is what? La ilaha illallah. So this, when you go there, brothers, don't destroy it. Don't destroy your hajj without coming with, uh, and, uh, without coming uh, with tawheed. How much, how long is left for the salah? Four minutes, he will carry on after the salah, inshallah ta'ala. Naam. So the messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he turned towards the qibla when he went to Safa, and he made a dua. فوحد الله, he singled Allah in tawheed. وكبر. So the word فوحد is the word tawheed, where it comes from. وكبر, and he made takbir. وقال, he said, لا إله إلا الله. وحده لا شريك له له الملك وله الحمد وهو على كل شيء قدير لا إله إلا الله وحده أنجز وعده ونصر عبده وهزم الأحزاب وحده. That's what the messenger صلى الله عليه وسلم said. ثم دعا بين ذلك ثلاث مرات. And the messenger صلى الله عليه وسلم he supplicated between that three times. So in other words, when he said that لا إله إلا الله he make a dua. لا إله إلا الله he make a dua. دعا بين ذلك ثلاث مرات. he would make dua between that three times. نزل he went down to مروتي towards مروة. حتى صبت قدماه في بطن الوادي until the messenger صلى الله عليه وسلم he elevated to the valley. pay attention here. this place there used to be a valley which is the green part that you see today. once upon a time it was a wadi. Okay, now there's a green mark on two sides, and then you walk forward, there's another two sides. On the two sides, there's a green. This is where the Prophet, ﷺ, what did he do? Sa'a. He walked fast. So when we go to Safa wal Marwa, that green part, you see people jogging, you jog. You go a bit fast in speed. Hatta ida sa'adata masha ila al Marwata. Masha ila al Marwati, he went to Marwa. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. فَفَعَلَ عَلَى الْمَرْوَةِ مَا فَعَلَ عَلَى الصفا. The messenger did what he did in Safa. He did in, he did in Marwa what he did in Safa. This shows that the person, he should strive hard to take his time when it comes to these acts. You go to Safa, do what you're meant to do. You go to Marwa, do what you're meant to do. Take your time. Look, the messenger وسلم, did exactly what he did again. Some people get, the, they get bored of doing it. And so they quickly go off up and, up and down. Don't let hastiness take you. Leave, to leave off the dua and the dhikr. Say these things, do them. Then Hafid ibn Hajar then said, فَذَكَرَ الْحَدِيثَ وَفِيهِ If you look, he says, فَذَكَرَ الْحَدِيثَ He mentioned the hadith. Hafid ibn Hajar summarized. He summarized it. He cut the hadith. From this minute onwards, the hadith is cut. Ibn Hajar got rid of the uh, other things. The reason why he did that because he, the hadith is long and there was so much information and so much other things. He just wants to focus on that which is needed. But the person has finished their what? Umrah. But what do they do? They shave their hair. Or they shorten it. After Safa wal Marwa, the person either shortens their hair, and the reason why they will shorten their hair is because they want to catch up Hajj with some hair to shave, right? You need some hair to shave. 
but it's, re- it's very good to, sh- uh, to shave off their head. To shave off. Because the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam The Messenger made dua for the ones who shave three times. The Hadith in Bukhari and Muslim, in Hadith Ibn Umarin, the Messenger said, Allahumma arhamil muhalliqina. And they said to him, Wal muqassirina, what about the ones who shorten our message of Allah? And then he said, Allahumma arhamil muhalliqina. He said, Ya Rasulullah, wal muqassirina. He said, Allahumma arhamil muhalliqina wal muqassirina. On the third time he said that. But he made dua for what? Three times he made dua for the uh, muhalliqin. The muqassirin on the third, the muqassirin the third time he made dua for them. And then shaven is better. It's good to, it's good to shave. And that's what the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he himself did. And Allah Tabaraka Ta'ala, he started with the ones who shave first in the Quran. What did he say? Muhalliqina ru'usakum wa muqassirina. Muhalliqina was mentioned, the ones who shave their hair. Then Allah mentions the one who shorten, shorten their hair. This is now finished and it's done for the person who is, um, they've done their umrah, they finished their umrah, and they completed their umrah. Like in the one who is doing Qiran or is doing Al-Mufrad, Al-Ifrad, he stays in his Ihram wala yatahallal, and he get, doesn't get out of it. Okay? He stays in it. Are we all together? But what is more virtuous, more virtuous is that he does tahallul, like in, that is, if he doesn't have a hedgy with him. It's better that he does tamattu'ah. So it's from the three types, the only person who can clean himself, get himself into his ihram, do what he wants to do, is the, the tamattu'ah. Like if he's doing al-qiran, and he's doing al-ifrad, he's going to have to stay in his state of ihram until when? Until Yawm Tarwiyah, the eighth day of Dil Hijjah. Like at that moment, can he change it? Is he allowed to change at that moment? Yes, he can. The Prophet ﷺ commanded the companions to change it. This is where he told them to change it. And he said to the ones who didn't bring their hadi with them, their sacrifice animal, he said to them, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, do tahallul. Wear your clothes, go into a state of ihram. So, but like in, if you're Qiran, if you boot your hadi, you stay for ihram and you stay in your state of ihram by the al ifrad. The eighth day comes of Dil Hijjah. The eighth day of Dil Hijjah comes, which is known as the Yawm al That's why Ibn Hajr went into that straight away. He said, Falamma kana Yawm al when the eighth day of Dil Hijjah came, Tawajjahu ila mina. They went towards what? They went towards what? To Mina. They went towards Mina. So the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam went to Mina. Mina, why was it? Sorry, Yawm Tarwiya. Why was it called Tarwiya? What was the hikmah? And what's the reason of calling it Tarwiya? Is as I told you, Kanu yatarawwawna fihi min al ma'i. It was the day that they will give water to their riding beasts. And they themselves will drink water. Okay, they would drink a lot of water, um, they would get themselves ready. That's why it was called Yawm Tarwiya. Ila Mina, on that eighth day, where do you go to? Mina. The person goes to, he goes to Mina. You, the mutamatti' the one who's doing the tamattu' from his house on the Yawm Tarwiya, from his hotel, he puts on his ihram. When he puts on his ihram, he goes. Uh, towards uh, Mina. He goes towards uh, Mina. The Sunnah is, as we're going to see, وَرَكِبَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ The Messenger, he mounted on his riding beast. فَصَلَّى بِهَا الظُّهْرَ وَالْعَصْرَ وَالْمَغْرِبَ وَالْعِشَاءَ وَالْفَجْرَ The Messenger prayed those five prayers in Mina. قَصْرًا مِنْ غَيْرِ جَمْعٍ He's ta- how, what did he do? He shortened the prayers, but he didn't combine them. He prayed Dhuhr at his own time. He shortened it into two. He prayed Asr at his own time. He prayed two. He prayed Maghrib, three, of course. There's no Qasr for Maghrib. And then Isha, he prayed how many? Two. And Al-Fajr, 
and Al Isha he prayed two, and Al Maghrib he prayed. Uh, sorry, Al Fajr he prayed two. There's nothing to change there. Once you pray Isha and then Maghrib, sorry, Al Isha and then Fajr, 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 the person he stays. Until the sun rises. Pay attention here. This is the difference between Mina and Muzdalifa. Muzdalifa, the person leaves, as we're going to see soon, before the sun rises. Because the Prophet opposed the Quraysh, the, the Jahiliyyah, what they used to do. Lakin, Mina, once you pray Fajr, you don't leave, you stay there, you remain until the sun rises. What about if a person doesn't, he doesn't wait for uh, um, Fajr? He doesn't wait for Fajr. He leaves way before Fajr. They oppose, those who do that, they oppose the Sunnah. And the ones who didn't wear the Ihram on the eighth day also oppose the Sunnah. Even if it's permissible for them. Like in they oppose the Sunnah. If what about Yawmut Tarwiyah can happen, it has happened. Yawmut Tarwiyah, what about if it happens on a Friday? If it happens on a, if it happens on a Friday, remember, Yawmut Tarwiyah, where do you have to be at Mina, what time? If you want to follow the Sunnah? Duhur, right? What about if that day is Yawmul Jum'ah and you're in Mecca, right? Should you wait and pray Jum'ah in the Haram and then go to Mina? Or should you go to Mina and pray there Dhuhr? Which one is better? Huh? Go. Who, who believes you should go to Mina? Put your hand up. It's Jum'ah. It's Friday. Should I just stay in the Mecca? Pray Jum'ah in the Haram? And then go to Mina? Or should I follow the Sunnah of the Prophet in the Hajj and go to Mina at Dhuhr? Put your hand up if you, go, if you believe you should go to Mina. And put your hand up if you believe you should stay for Jum'ah in the Haram and pray behind Abdul Rahman Sudais. Ya yeah, Muhammad. What you, no one, huh? Sahih, correct. Mina, staying there is an ibadah. It's not just the salah, dhuhr you're praying. Staying there is an ibadah, okay? And this is the fatwa of Shaykh Ibn Uthaymin, rahimahullah ta'ala. So the Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he stayed there hatta tal'at shamsi until the sun rose. فَأَجَازَ حَتَّى أَتَعَرَفَ What does it mean فَأَجَازَ? He went by, he passed by. What did he pass by? The messenger passed by Muzdalifa. He passed by Muzdalifa, he didn't go to Muzdalifa. Are we all together brothers? So when you come from Mina, you're going to pass by Muzdalifa, go through it. Okay, go through it. The messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he went through it. Salawatullahi wa salamu alayhi. He went through Muzdalifa and he didn't stand there, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He headed towards what? He headed towards, where is he heading towards? The eighth, what's the ninth? Yom Arafah. So the messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, was heading to Arafah. He crossed through Muzdalifa. Ponder with me over here. It's, the narration says, حَتَّى when the Messenger of Allah said, pay in the hadith, pay attention with me on the hadith, the love, the wording in the Arabic. It says, فَأَجَازَ حَتَّى أَتَى عَرَفَ He crossed through Muzdalifa until he came to what? Arafa. Pay attention. Then after the hadith says, فَوَجَدَ He found الْقُبَّةَ The tent قَدْ ضُرِبَتْ لَهُ It was done for him. لَهُ بِنَمِرَ إِنْ نَمِرَ فَنَزَلَ بِهَا And he stayed in Namira. So it seems that Namira is what? Part of Arafah, because the hadith just said, فَأَجَازَ حَتَّى أَتَى عَرَفَةً Until he came to Arafah, correct? So here the scholars, they have two discussions. A group of scholars, two views. One group of scholars, they say that بعض الفقهاء and even some of the people of the languages, etc. They said that Namira is in Arafah. And another group of scholars, which is the strongest opinion, Shaykh al-Islam, Ibn Taymiyyah, Ibn al-Qayyim, Imam al-Nawi, and other great scholars, they said, and the Namira is not part of Arafah. Okay, it's not part of Arafah. Good. Uh, so the person goes to Namira, 
when they come from Mina, they stay there for a little bit. The question here is, did the messenger stay in Namira? Did he remain in Namira? Because that it is one of the things that you need to do in Hajj, or did he do it because he was tired and he... Whichever of the case it is, whatever it is, it's a sunnah to do it. Because the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ was clear, خُذُوا عَنِّي مَنَاسِكَكُمْ Take your, your manasik in Hajj, take it from me. Do as I do. Here we take a ben- two benefits from the, this statement uh, of the hadith where it says, فَوَجَدَ الْقُبَّةَ تَقَدْ ضُرِبَتْ لَهُ بِنَامِرَةٍ فَنَزَلَ بِهَا We take two benefits. جَوَازُ istidlal, The permissibility of those who use umbrellas. You're allowed to use umbrella. And so it goes against those who say you can't put something on top of your head. Naam, you can't place something on top of your head. But an umbrella or going inside a car or going inside a tent, there's nothing wrong with that. Okay? As long as it's not stuck to your head. You can't wear a hat or you can't put your ihram on your head. Like if it's a roof or if it's a car or if it's an umbrella, none of the, that's, there's no problem with that. Okay? There's no problem with that. That's the benefit that we take from it. The second benefit that we take from it is that it's recommended. It's recommended to sit in Namira until Zawali Shams, until the meridian. Okay? According to one of the views. Because everything that the Messenger does in Hajj, the asal is that it's ta'abudi. That's the asal. Anyone who says he did it because he was tired and whatnot, We'll say you have to give an evidence for that because everything in Hajj so far is to us ibadah. And to remove it from that ibadah, it needs evidence. It, ne- it needs evidence. Okay? So the messenger stayed there until the zawal. Okay? The zawal, which is the zenith or the meridian. Hatta ida zagati shamsu amra bil qaswai. So he stayed there, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. نعم. حتى إذا زاغت الشمس when the sun moved from the meridian slightly زنث أمر بالقصوى the messenger commanded for his riding beast to be prepared for him صلى الله عليه وسلم that's what he commanded فروحلت له it was prepared for him it was done فأتى بطن الوادي then the messenger صلى الله عليه وسلم he descended down to the valley this wadi is called Urana Wadi Urana, the Prophet sallallahu came. فَخَطَبَ النَّاسَ The Messenger done a khutbah. This is where khutbah al-wadda' was done. Are we all together? And today you find that Masjid, Masjid al-Namira, where the Mufti of Saudi Arabia and other, they do it exactly there. The, the Masjid today of, uh, the Masjid al-Namira today, part of, its, part, part of the Masjid is in Arafah, and part of it is outside of Arafah, if you look at the Masjid, how it's built. Okay? Khutbah was done by the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I'm just going to quickly mention this khutbah that the Messenger did what he said. Quickly, um, what do we take from this khutbah? Khutbah Yawm Arafah is called. The things that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam spoke about that day, the largest khutbah he ever had, Alayhi Salatu Wasallam, never has he had that large khutbah, and never did he have it after that, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So this moment, the Messenger chose the most vital and important things to talk about. He spoke about the first thing is تَحْرِيمُ دِمَاءِ الْمُسْلِمِينَ وَأَمْوَالِهِمْ That the blood of the Muslims are haram from one another. The Muslims should not kill one another. They are not allowed to. He started with that sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He said, إِنَّ دِمَاءَكُمْ وَأَمْوَالَكُمْ حَرَامٌ عَلَيْكُمْ كَحُرْمَةِ يَوْمِكُمْ هَذَا That's the first thing he said sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The blood of the Muslim. The blood of the Muslims is very important, Ya Ikhwah. The Prophet said in another hadith, لا ترجع بعد كفارا يضرب بعضكم رقاب بعض Do not become disbelievers after me. Killing one another. Slicing each other's necks. Killing each other. This was the Prophet Wasallam's message. So today we see that the Muslim blood has become easy. Anyone opposes you, you don't like him, you don't agree with his ideology, you just uh, kill him. Murder him. The blood has become very easy. The first thing he started with was, "Inna dima'akum, your bloods, wa amwalakum, and your wealth, and also your ibd, your honors. You can't just slander a person. 
You can't play around with somebody's honor today. This is something you're not allowed to do. It's become sad. The Prophet said, it's haram from you like it's haram in this place and like it's haram in this month and like it's haram in this day. It's the day of Arafah. The month is Dil Hijjah. And the third one is, it is what? Baytillah al-Haram. The scholars, uh, it's in the sacred land. Number two. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he spoke about وَضْعُ كُلُّ شَيْءٍ مِنْ أَمْرِ الْجَاهِلِيَةِ وَإِبْطَالُهُ To reject, to get rid of, to uh, remove all of the pre-Islamic practices. And guess what he mentioned? What did he specific mention? He mentioned sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He said, وَأَوَّلُ The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, وَرِبَ الْجَاهِلِيَةِ مَوْضُوعُ The riba interests they call it today usury the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he said it is from the islam it's the pre-islamic practice is jahiliya riba is jahiliya wa awwalu riban and the first riba that i'm going to get rid of is the riba of abbas ibn abdul muttalib fa inna mawdu'un kullu all of it is fabricated all of it is destroyed this hadith shows us to stay away from riba Look at how many 1,400 something years later how the Muslims have turned to be. Number three, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he said, "Fattaqu Allaha, fear Allah, fi nisa'i in the affairs of the women, fa inna kum akhtubuhun bi amani Allah, wa istahlaltum furujahun bi kalimat Allah, fear Allah in the affairs of the women, al wasiyatu bi nisa, wal hathi alayhim, wal hathi ala ala al ihsan ilayhinna. Be rightful towards your wives, take care of this, take care of them." Be good towards them. The Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the fourth point that he mentioned in that day is Al Wasiya to be Kitabillahi. Holding on to the book of Allah Azza wa Jalla. The Kitab Al Ladila Til Batilu min Bain Yadehi wala min Khalfi Tanzil min Aziz and Hamid. Holding on to this book. The Messenger said, Wakat Taraktu Alaik fikum. I have left in you, amongst you, Ma Lan Tadillu. You're never going to be misguided بعده, after this. I have left with you something that if you hold on to, you'll never be misguided. Kitab Allah, the book of Allah. The book of the, Allah is a guidance for us. Any problems that we have, any issues that we have, it will guide us. The fifth point that he mentioned was, he said, he told the companions, you guys are responsible on my behalf. You will be questioned about me about whether I conveyed the message, about whether I fulfilled my obligation. You guys will be asked about me <coughs> that day, the day of judgment. What will you say that day? They said, we will say, we testify that you, Muhammad, had conveyed the message. You fulfilled what was upon you. You were sincere in your advice. فَقَالَ بِأُصْبُعِهِ The messenger took his finger, the, this finger, السبابة, and he pointed it towards the sky, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and that's because that's where Allah is. And he pointed this finger towards the sky, and then he pointed it towards the people, and then he pointed it towards the sky, and he said, Allahumma shahad, oh Allah, testify to this. And then he said, Allahumma shahad, oh Allah, testify to this. Allahumma shahad, oh Allah, testify to this. Witness this three times, he said it, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This shows that he was concerned that that message reached, that that was conveyed on his behalf, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That was the biggest gathering that he had. That which he said that day, brothers, fear Allah in those five main points that he said. Fear Allah in it. Hold on to the sunnah that he left you with. Fear Allah wa ta'ala in the pre-Islamic practices that you're practicing. Stay away from riba. Wallahi, it will destroy you and it will destroy your family. Allah says in the Quran, Yamhaqullahu riba wa yurbi sadaqat. Allah is destroying riba. And Allah increases sadaqah. Wallahi, don't disobey Allah for 10 days, 10 years, 30 years that you want to get rizq for a punishment that's long lasting. Wallahi, your skin will not be able to endure it. The person who takes riba is in direct battle with Allah Azza wa Jalla. Directly, you're fighting with Allah. It's a mubaraza. Mubaraza means you are directly in co combat with Allah Azza wa Jalla. 
Can any one of us do that? Can any of us fight with Allah? Who's going to win in a battle between us and Allah? Allah is going to win. So stay away from it. Also fear Allah wa ta'ala in the bloods of the Muslims. The wealth of a Muslim that you take. You might take some money today and think, okay, no one's going to know. Lakin Allah is not unaware of it. It's somebody's wealth that you've got in your possession. Give it back. If you've taken someone's wealth already and you've done that mistake and you fell short in that regard, it's not too late. At-tahallul min al Today you have the opportunity. Go and clear your name. Say, brother, how can I pay you back whatever your money is? I will give it to you in installments. No problem. I don't want to come at the day of judgment and this money. The Prophet ﷺ said to us in a hadith, At-tahallul min al Free yourself from the people's wealth. Because you will come the day of judgment. It is not dirham and dinar. It's not pennies and pounds and dollars. It's rewards. Your righteous deeds are going to be taken. And once that finishes, you're going to take sins. So be careful. Also, remember Allah when it comes to the people's honor. Don't just talk about somebody's name and reputation and rip through their honor. Remember the day of judgment. Allah wa ta'ala, will take from you their, your righteous deeds. So that's the khutbah that the messenger did Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam And anyone who takes that position that day Who's doing khutbah in Arafah It's necessary that he talks about Masailu tawheed He talks about aqidah and tawheed He talks about rulings that people can take that day He talks about social and issue problems That the Muslims are facing He talks about unity and bringing the Muslims Upon a correct way and a correct path He warns them against the division he tells them about the enemies and those who are plotting and planning against them. All of those things is what the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam spoke about that day. The day of Arafah. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. When he finished that, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, فَخَطَبَ النَّاسَ He did the khutbah. ثُمَّ أَذَّنَ ثُمَّ أَقَامَ That shows that the khutbah of uh, Arafah is not, is not Jum'ah. It's not like the Jum'ah. It's different. Because the khutbah al Arafah is only one khutbah. It's not two stands. Num- number two, Arafah, you don't do the adhan first and then the khutbah. No, no, the khutbah is done, then the adhan is done. Like in khutbah to Jum'ah, what's done first? The adhan and then the khutbah happens. Yom Arafah, the khutbah is done, then the adhan. Because it says, Thumma adhana, then the adhan was done. Adhana doesn't mean the Prophet did the adhan, meaning he commanded someone to do the adhan. ثم أقام and then the messenger stood up فصلى الظهر they prayed ظهر ثم أقام فصلى العصر and then the messenger led them for صلاة العصر ولم يصلي بينهما شيئا and the prophet did not pray sunnah between ظهر and عصر so you don't pray no sunnah ثم ركب and then the messenger mounted حتى أتى الموقف until he came to until he came to the موقف صلى الله عليه وسلم the موقف here is um, the mountain that people today call Jabal al Rahma. It's not called Jabal al Rahma. The people love to call it that name. He came there, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and what he did was he gathered he gathered some pebbles. Sallallahu Alaihi Alaihi. Keep in mind the wadi, the valley of Urana is not part of Arafah. Okay? It's not part of Arafah. Even if you go there right now, you'll see that on the billboard, it says, Bidaya to Arafah, the beginning of Arafah. And guess what, subhanAllah, you see, some people are sitting in the wadi and the valley of Urana, all Arafah, and they think they're part of Arafah. If they look forward, they just see the billboard that says, Arafah starts from here. Be careful, Arafah you can't miss. You can't miss Arafah. So, the Prophet, it's called Urana, where the Prophet done the khutbah, Namira, is not part of, uh, it's not... It's not part of Arafah, as we just said right now. So you have to go to Arafah. It's two, three, a f- couple of spe- steps to take. You, get, you go into the Arafah. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he stand, he stood up in the boundaries of Arafah, the boundary of Arafah. Anywhere within Arafah, that's the mawqif. So many people, they think it's only Jabal al rahma as they call it. Everyone's on top of the mountain. That's not from the Sunnah. The Prophet didn't do it because that is the place that you get closer to Allah by it. Anywhere in the hudud of Arafah you can go. Anywhere you can go. Why is it called Arafah? What's, what's the reason it's called Arafah? Where does this come from? 
some of the scholars they said the reason why it's called Arafah is because an nas yata'arafuna fiha, the people get to know each other. Arafah yata'arafuna. People get to know each other there. That's why it's called uh, Arafah. Another group of people they said, they said that Jibreel, he did tawaf with Ibrahim. Jibreel did tawaf with Ibrahim. And whenever Jibreel would show something to uh, Ibrahim and how to do it, Jibreel would say to Ibrahim, A'arafta, did you, do you know? Do you understand, you've understood this? A'arafta, did you understand it? So that's why it was called Arafa. And other, great, other people, they said, لأن آدم الحواء عندما هبط من الجنة Some people, they said that when Adam and Hawa were sent down from the Sama and they came down, the place that they got to know each other again from was Arafah. So they met again each other in Arafah. All of those are what they say. Or the last view that I saw was that some people, they said it's because Arafah is a bit higher than the rest of the Malasik. It's a bit higher. The earth and the land is a bit higher. And the Arabs, they call something high. Urfan, they call it, if it's high. I have no, I just, I just, I haven't, I don't know which one is true. I have no idea. But you can just mention all of the opinions, this is what was said. But your iman won't increase or decrease if you find out. And you, it doesn't have any connection with your hajj. It's just a side benefit. فَجَعَلَ بَطْنَ نَاقَتِهِ الْقَصْوَىٰ إِلَى السَّخَرَاتِ وَجَعَلَ حَبْلُ الْمُشَاتِ بَيْنَ يَدَيْهِ وَاسْتَقْبَلَ الْقِبْلَةَ فَلَمْ يَزَلْ وَاقِفًا حَتَّى غَرَبَتِ الشَّمْسُ The Messenger صلى الله عليه وسلم, he stayed there in Arafah until the sun, until the sun set. وَذَهَبَتِ الصُّفْرَةُ قَلِيلًا And it got really dark. حَتَّى غَابَ الْقُرْسُ وَدَفَعَ وَقَدْ شَنَقَ لِلْقَصْوَىٰءِ الزِّمَامَ The Messenger stayed there until the sun set. And as I said to you before, Arafah, two things you need to do. You have to be in Arafah and you also have to stay there until the sun sets like the Messenger did, alayhi salatu wasalam. And if you don't stay before the sun, you leave before the sun sets, then remember on you is a blood. Sacrifice animal. وَقَدْ شَنَقَ لِسْقَ الْسْوَاءِ الزِّمَامَ The Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, what he did was on his riding beast, al-qaswa, he's in Arafah right now. He's going to go to Muzdalifah now. So he mounted on his riding beast, or he was on his riding beast, and he slightly pulled his riding beast. And he pulled his riding beast so much so that the riding beast's head went back until it touched the saddle. And the Messenger وسلم, only did that so he could move, the, the, so his riding beast can move slowly and not go fast. And he would say with his right hand, وَيَقُولُ بِيَدِهِ الْيُمْنَ أَيُّهَا النَّاسَ السَّكِينَةَ السَّكِينَةَ People, tranquility, tranquility. So it's necessary when people are coming from Arafah to Mazdalifah, السَّكِينَةَ السَّكِينَةَ Tranquility. And subhanAllah, now you find the buses and the coaches and the cars going whoosh, whoosh, fast. السَّكِينَةَ السَّكِينَةَ Tranquility. People are running as well. السَّكِينَةَ السَّكِينَةَ Tranquility. Every time the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam came towards uh, a, a, a elevated place, he would let it go because if he pushes it, pulls it back, he won't be able to climb properly. But then after that, he would grab it again to make it go slower. Hatta atal muzdalifa until the messenger came to muzdalifa. Fasalla biha al maghriba. The messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam he prayed maghrib there. Well, isha and he prayed isha. Pay attention, as I said to you before. When sunset, you left Arafah, right? But you don't pray. You don't pray Maghrib. The sun has set, yes. It's Maghrib time, yes. Ignore it. Go and take Maghrib and Isha, Jam'u Ta'khir to Muzdalifah. That's the Sunnah. Like in sometimes the coach, people getting in the coach, getting all the people together, and the time and everything. Sometimes what might happen is you may not get to Arafah because of the Ziham and the so it's no problem if you pray in the tariq, if you pray on the way. Because of the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, the earth is all a masjid. You can pray whenever, if it gets caught. But the messenger prayed Maghrib and Isha in Muzdalifah. Bi adhan wahidin with one adhan. Wa iqamataini and two iqama. Wa lam yusabbih baynahuma. And he didn't do no tasbih between the two. 
So when you pray Maghrib and Isha, you don't do Tasbih or anything. Straight you pray Maghrib, then you pray Isha straight away. Are we all together? And remember, just because you're praying the Maghrib at the Isha time, the order of the prayer doesn't change. Which Salah comes first, Maghrib or Isha? The Maghrib prays. You pray Maghrib first. Once you pray Maghrib, then you pray Isha. Are we all together? You don't do any tasbih between the Maghrib and the Isha. As soon as you say Salam Alaikum, Salam Alaikum for Maghrib, you get up again straight away for Isha. Second Iqama is done. No Adhan. Adhan was done once. Second Iqama, Isha is prayed as well. The Messenger did that. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Thumma Baja'a, the Messenger slept her. Shortened. It shortened as well. Is Jam and Qasr. We mentioned that, right? Did we not? Yeah? We mentioned it when we went over it. The hadith says that the Prophet slept. He lied down, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And what does that show? It shows that the person shouldn't do any qiyamul layl or any, any righteous. No, just sleep. The only thing that you do is you pray witr. Because the Prophet ﷺ was known never to leave witr. Generally, he never left it. Um, the general narrations mention that he used to do witr. And he never used to leave it. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So it's necessary to do that. Qiyamul layl. You can if you want to. But the hadith shows that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he didn't. Salawatullahi wa sallam. He slept straight away. Thumma taja'a, the messenger slept. He lied, he slept. Hatta tala al-fajr, until the sun, until fajr. Fasalla al-fajr, the Prophet prayed fajr. Hina tabayyana lahu subhu. Until the fajr time entered and it became clear to him. Bi adhanin with adhan. Wa iqamatin and with iqama. He prayed what? He prayed Fajr. Thumma rakiba, then the messenger mounted, hatta atal mash'ar al-haram, until he came to where? Until he came to mash'ar al-haram. Mash'ar al-haram, there he prayed, faced the Qibla. Fada'a, he made dua. Wa kabbara, and he made takbir. Wa hallala, he said, la ilaha illallah. Falam yazal waqifan. He stayed there, hatta asfara, until it became asfar, Jiddan. The person, he prays what? He prays Fajr. He prays, he prays Fajr. Like it is permissible for leaving Fajr, before Fajr, it is permissible, as the scholars mentioned, for the women, the children, the elderly, the weak, the sick, they can leave before that. They can leave. And they can go. But they, the, what was needed for them is to stay, spend the night in what? They have to stay the night in Muzalifa. al mabitu bin Muzalifa is, is necessary. They have to do that. But before Fajr, just before Fajr, they leave. <laughs> to, to, to not get caught up with the rest of the people, this is permissible for them. Like in the messenger prayed and he stayed there. قبل أن تطلع الشمس, but he left what? When did he leave? He left before the sun rose. This is to oppose the, the disbelievers, Quraysh and their likes. They wouldn't stay. They would wait and they would sit around um, until it became excessively bright. Umar radiallahu anhu narrated, إِنَّ الْمُشْرِكِينَ كَانُوا لَا يُفِضُونَ حَتَّى تَطْلُعَ الشَّمْسِ وَيَقُولُونَ أَشْرِفْ ثَبِيرٌ وَأَنَّ النَّبِيَ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ خَالَفَهُمْ ثُمَّ أَفَاضَ قَبْلَ أَنْ تَطْلُعَ الشَّمْسُ رواه البخاري. They would, stay, they would stay there and they would look at a mountain that's called Thabir. And they would wait for Thabir to become clear for them. That mountain, they would wait until it was proper, the sun was out and everyone can see it, that's when they would leave. And they would say to the mountain, Ashrif, O oh sun, shine for us, Thabir. So the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he opposed them. He used to leave Qabla and Tatlu Asham. Before the sun rises, he used to leave. Alayhi salatu wasalam. And he wouldn't wait. They, on the other hand, Quraysh, they didn't like going to Arafah. Quraysh would never go to Arafah. And the reason why, because Arafah is not part of, is not part of Mecca. It's outside Mecca. Are we all together? They wouldn't want to go. They used to say, we're the people of Mecca, we should stay in Mecca. And Allah wa ta'ala told them in the ayah, ثُمَّ أَفِيضُوا مِنْ حَيْثُ 
ثُمَّ أَفِيدُوا مِنْ حَيْثُ أَفَاضَ النَّاسِ Go wherever the people go. You're part of the people. You have no... So the messenger used to go to Arafah, alayhi salatu wasalam. Before he goes to... Uh, alayhi salatu wasalam, he went to... So Muzdalifah now, and now he would go to Mina. From Muzdalifah you go to... You go to Mina. But before he went to Mina, Atta Atta Batna Muhassirin. The Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he would go where? He would go through a valley known as the Muhassir. The hadith, the story, the narration mentions, qabla an ashamsu. He left before the sun rose. Hatta Atta until he came to Batna Muhassirin, the valley of Muhassir. When he got here, like him, he moved his riding beast a bit fast. He moved his riding beast a bit fast. Why did he move his riding beast a bit fast? What's the reason why he did that? Sallallahu alayhi wasallam. The scholars, they mention some reasons. Let me tell you what some of the reasons are. Some of the reasons is that هذا أمر تعبدي It's just the ibadah, we have to do it. That's some scholars, what they said. A group, another group of scholars, they said لأن الله أهلك في أصحاب الفيل أصحاب الفيل Allah destroyed them here. وينبغي للإسلام أن يسرع so it's necessary when you come by that place because it was a place Allah destroyed a people, go fast, go quickly. But that is very weak. That reasoning is a weak reasoning. Uh, the reason is because the people of Ashabul Fil were not actually destroyed there. They were destroyed in a place called Mughammasin. That's, just, that's where they were destroyed. Uh, which is around Abbah. That's where they were destroyed. And if that was the case then, if Wadi Muhassir, if you go there, you went there, you went by there fast because of the fact Allah destroyed Ashabul Feel. I mean, the people of the Feel, that means even other than Hajj, if you went by that place, you'd have to go fast. Not specifically only for Hajj, right? It'd be any other time in the year as well. So, no, that wasn't the case. Like in the reason why the Messenger went by fast, and this is the correct opinion, is because the people of Jahiliyyah used to stand there for a while. They used to spend time and they would mention their forefathers and they would praise them over there. So the messenger wanted to oppose them as he had opposed them in going to Arafah. He would go fast, he wouldn't do that. And as you can see, the concept of Hajj is going against the non Muslims, not being like them, having ibadat and things that are unique for you. You consistently will see that in Hajj. Are you with me? الوسطى, then the messenger took the middle path that goes towards the what? This is the day of Nahar, right? We're in the day of Nahar, the day of the slaughter. What is it that the person should do that day? He throws Jamratul Aqaba. He throws. That's what the messenger did based on this hadith. That day what the person also does is nahr, they slaughter. Number three, the person that day, what does he do? He does al-halqu or with taqseer who shortens his hair. Or he shaves it. And the fourth thing that the person does that day is tawaf al which is a pillar from hajj, bi ijma' by consensus of the scholar. And that's why it says, hatta ata al-jamrata allati inda shajarati faramaha bi sabi hasayatin. The person should stone that day. You stone. Pay attention. It's two things I want you to remember when it comes to the stoning. Number one, each of those seven, only one thing that you stone, by the way. You only stone Jamarat al Aqaba. You take pebbles, throw. Two. So it's one, two, three, four, five, and six. And seven, sorry. Seven pebbles you throw. Good. What about if the person takes all the seven and he just throws all of them one time? All seven of them is counted as one. Look for another seven. What about if the person just takes the seven and he puts it on the, on the, on the place? He doesn't throw them, he just puts them down. Huh? It's also not considered to be throwing. You went against the Prophet. You have to throw. Are we all together? You have to? You have to throw. Those are the two things I want you to remember, inshallah ta'ala. You throw it inside the valley, you're going to see it. You throw it inside there. Then the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam went after the stoning. So after the stoning, the second thing that you do is what? And Naharu, you slaughter. 
ثم ركب رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم then the third thing that you do on the, the يوم النحر the third thing that you do is what فأفاض إلى البيت the prophet did طواف الإفاضة he went to Mecca and he did what so جمر when you do your رمي جمر عقبة you go straight to Mecca and you do طواف الإفاضة okay فصلى بمكة الظهر and he prayed ظهر in Mecca صلى الله عليه وسلم the shaving happens before the nahar. Uh, sorry, before the tawaf uh, al Before the tawaf al So once you do the jamara, once you slaughter, then you shave. Okay? And you're generally going to see the people anyways. There's the slaughtering happening and the shaving on the other side happening as well. Best thing to do is shave. I told you because of the, the dua that the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam gave. The fourth is you do the tawaf al ifada which is a pillar. Okay? Now. No, the person should do it straight away. Based on the hadith of the Prophet. You should not delay it. And that's what the hadith of Jabir ibn Abdullah he mentioned for us. Any other ahkam related to Hajj, we mentioned it before, we mentioned it elsewhere. That's what took place in the long, famous hadith of Jabir. Um, and I think, inshallah ta'ala, we have a good understanding of hajj now. And what hajj is like and how, what should be done. Hadith of Jabir is long. So, Idarik ibn Hajar, after he finished it, what did he say? Rawahu Muslimun mutawwalan. Muslim narrated this hadith in a more lengthier way. But we took what's important, what you need. And I think, inshallah ta'ala, that's fair to say now. It's fair to say now that we have an understanding of what needs to be done for Hajj. Inshallah ta'ala. There's always more knowledge to learn. There's always more knowledge to increase in. I want to share something with you. I was thinking about it, contemplating. Shall I share? Shall I not share? I think I'll share it with you guys. Because a lot of you guys kept coming every day. I had a dream the other day. After looking at the hadiths and Bulug al Maram preparing it that night, I, I slept whilst on my sofa, whilst reading. I slept on the side and it was a long sleep normally I end up getting up quicker than others other, other times but I slept and in my dream what I saw was me telling my children to get ready I was telling them get up re- prepare yourselves we're going we're going and so my children said dad where are we going I said we're going to meet the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam get up everybody prepare yourself and my children got ready my son my daughters all of us and we came out, it was like it was What I can describe it to be, it was like it was Eid Everyone's coming out of their house When I came out, everyone else was coming out of their houses We all go into a place, an open place So we walked for a while Until we came to an open place, and like a park, an open land But it wasn't grass, it was sand Everyone is there As we walked, we walked, we walked There's a, there's a line for every party there's one line on this side, which is on the right, and a line on the other side. The people on the, line, the left side are going faster than the ones on the right. So, sorry, before we came into the park or the land, there was a security told us, you go, you're not allowed to come into this place. And another group of people, they were told to come in. So I came, I said, Salaam Alaikum, and I was told to come in, and all my children, I came, they came in with me. So we went in. A lot of people were like, why can't we come in? I didn't hear what was said to them, but we went into the open land. Um, we, wa- we walked, and as we're walking, we're on the right side. I have my children right around me, and I see an ma- old man, not, not, not very old, but senior in age, but not old as in the sense he can't walk or anything. But he has a walking stick And there's another man holding him from the arm like this And I asked someone, I said, who's that? Because they just looked unique from everybody else And I was told the one who has the walking stick is Jabir ibn Abdullah And we all know Jabir became blind in his old age And I said, okay, who's the one holding him his hand? So he's holding him by the hand and he has a pen and a little notebook on his hand. And he's asking a question. 
And so they're talking, talking, I can see they're mumbling something, but when they come by me, the question that I hear that they say to each other is, or the question that he says to Jabir, this man says to Jabir, is, who were the people who narrated hadith from you? But then remember, they're on the fast track. We're on this line where we're, we're moving slow. They're just going out fast before us. So I asked, who is the other man asking the question? I was told it's Sheikh Al-Albani, rahimahullah. In my head, I'm, I'm, I'm saying to myself, I know why he's asking him that question. Because there's a discussion in Ilm al-Hadith whether Abu Zubayr al-Makki, Abu Zubayr heard from Jabir. If he narrated from Jabir, if he's from the students who heard from Jabir. There's that discussion going on in the science of Hadith. So he holds him, whenever he gives the answer, he writes something down and then grabs him from the arm. And they keep moving. And so at that moment, I, I was thinking, subhanAllah, he still wants to know hadith. He still wants to know the rulings of the science of hadith. And they walk until they get to the front row before everybody else. And the messenger standing there, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The messenger didn't stand for anyone else. No one was privileged for the Prophet to stand for them. Everybody else, the Prophet, sallam, they were kissing his head and they were shaking his hand and they would go. Keep Pay attention here. The Prophet ﷺ, when Jabir and Albani came, he stood up. And then the messenger grabbed Albani on the left side of his hand and the right hand side, he grabbed Jabir. And he brought them close to each other and in the middle of their heads, in the middle, the messenger whispered something and he looked at both of them and they smiled and the Prophet smiled. And then both of them went towards the, where the Prophet ﷺ is facing, in front of him. There's a lot of people sitting there, a lot of people. So we get to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi I shake his hand, I kiss him, I say, Ya Rasulullah, Abdurrahman, these are my children. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam greets, and then I go. I don't go the direction of Jabir and Albani. I get told, listen, go to the back. So the people were divided into two. A group that were told to go, and they were going to the place where the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is, they can see the Prophet, they can vision him, he's in front of them. And another group of people were put behind. And so the ones who were going behind, there was a security telling them, go this way, go this way. And the ones that were going right in front of the Prophet, they were told to go. So I asked, why can't I sit there? I want to see the Prophet. Why do I want to go behind the Prophet's back? And the thing that was said to me is, what did you do for the Prophet's religion? What have you, what, what, how have you served the deen of the Prophet? These people that you see are the great scholars of hadith. Al-Imam al-Bukhari and Muslim, Muslim ibn al-Hajjaj and Al-Imam uh, Abu Dawood and Ahmed ibn Hanbal and Ishaq. These are the people there. And Abu Bakr and Umar and Uthman and the people who gave their life, their everything to this religion that, that they work hard on it. And you, mashallah, good Muslim, at least you got to see the Prophet go behind now. And so my son, when we went into the, uh, behind the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and we sat down, my son said, Dad, I, 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 I want to go and see the Prophet. I want to I wanna, I wanna vision him. I want to see. Uh, why can't we go? Why, why can't we go where everyone else went? And uh, I said to him, Dad, it's, it's based on actions today. It's not about uh, anything else. We didn't get it. But he said, Dad, you used to teach a lot. You used to do this. Why? And I said, I never served a religion like Sheikh Al-Bani and Al-Imam Al-Bukhari and no way. That's really what I can remember. I don't remember the, pro the rest vividly. The point I want to take from this story, Wallahi, uh, um, is we have to take a role in, in this deen. Wallahi, we have to. We have to serve this deen, give our lives to it. If we want to be with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we have to be people who lived by his life, served his religion, work hard, every day of our life to just teach and educate and learn and study and really these people that's what they did that's why they were honored and they were as the poet said the people of hadith are the prophet's people they're his companions even if they didn't accompany him in this world they accompanied him by reading his hadiths reading his narrations 
this is where they accompanied him. I really, that dream really affected me. I thought about it a lot and a lot and a lot. And I said, SubhanAllah, we can really, we haven't really done anything for this religion. Haven't. These ahadiths have to study deeply, have to learn them properly. That's why the messenger said, I left two things for you the Quran and the Sunnah. Hold on to them, stick to them. And if you hold on to them, you will never be misguided after me. The book of Allah and the Sunnah of the Messenger. Oh Allah, make us those who hold on to. Hold on to the Quran and the Sunnah with their molar teeth. We never let go of it. Allahumma ghfir lana dhunubana wa israfana fi amrina wa thabbit aqdamana wa ansurna ala al-qawmi al-kafirin. Allahumma ghfir lana hazlana wa jiddana wa khata'ana wa amdana wa kullu thalika wa kullu thalika indana ya rabbal alameen. اللهم لا تجعل الدنيا أكبر همنا اللهم لا تجعل الدنيا أكبر همنا اللهم لا تجعل الدنيا أكبر همنا ولا مبلغ علمنا ولا تسلط علينا بذنوبنا من لا يخافك فينا ولا يرحمنا رب آت نفوسنا تقواها وزكها أنت خير من زكاها أنت وليها ومولاها ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار سبحانك اللهم بحمدك أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله استغفرك وأتوب إليك